Valar Morgulis. Valar Duhais. Welcome to Southside Westeros, where we explore the world of Game of Thrones. From the fist of the first man to the catacombs of the Red Keep, no secrets will be safe from us. Enter and forever be changed. There is only one God, and his name is Death. And there is only one thing we say to Death. Hello and welcome back to Southside Westeros. I am D. Paul and today you will not hear my tagline because you and I will be entering the web. Yes, we will talk about the spider, the Enoch, the center point for all things, the true master of whispers, Lord Varus. Yes, yes, I have been waiting for this one personally. And I'm sure a lot of you have. Now, this will be a little different from my normal spider's web exploration, so to speak. Um, I am not saying that I didn't have some issues with the way Varus was presented to us on screen. And do I feel that there were some missed opportunities? Possibly. Now, my, my true issue is his end. And what you may think I have an issue with may not in fact be that, but we're going to walk through it and figure this out together. Now, of course, if you are new to the Game of Thrones series, I do suggest that you watch it first because there will be spoiler alerts. There will be plot lines spoken about, and I just don't want to ruin it for you. Now, many people enjoy this podcast sight unseen and they've never seen the show and it's made them go see the show but I just feel it's a better companion because you can connect the dots a little better now I also want to remind you that we still have our secret episodes up on Patreon yep yep and we just uploaded another one so if you want to get over there and find some stuff that is going to be exclusive to you only you as a patron, get over there. It doesn't cost much, and you support the show. You'll get more great content, especially in regards to the House of the Dragon, because that stuff's going to be over on the YouTube channel. Yes, we're going to have YouTube podcasts. We already have them for Southside Westeros, but the House of the Dragons will be live reactions. So you're going to want to see that because we're going to have panels. It's not just going to be me. I know you love me. I love you. But there are going to be others that have different perspectives and insights, and I promise you it will be entertaining. Now, without further ado, the Master of Whispers. Now, who is Varus? Varus is a center character throughout the entire show. You see him, he's always lurking, always lurking and moving quietly through the shadows. And this is an unappreciated portion of the show, I feel. And it's framing and scene work. And I think the framing and scene work was so well done that it made up for a lot of the plot holes that are natural in a show, especially a show that was based on a book that took its time to set it up in your mind. Anytime you read a book, you're going to be super critical of the TV or film version of it. Because you, in reading that book, it's like the never-ending story, one of the best uh, summations of what it is for a reader to then be thrust into the reality of what they were reading. You as a reader, your mind takes that information. Excuse me for hitting the uh, the mic, people. I, I get excited. But your mind takes that information and it categorizes it and presents a story inside of you. And that story is specific to you. That's what makes the medium of books so wonderful. Because a thousand people can read a book and you have a thousand different versions. So it's very difficult to satisfy the masses on screen. And a lot of you have expressed to me a problem with how virus was presented. Now, it's a myriad of things. 
So I, I just don't feel like we'll go into each and every one. Um, however, I do believe we will benefit from just going through his background, going through the things that he did and some moves that he made that you may not be aware of. See, Varus was the hardest working man in Westeros. He never was off. Now, some of you may say because he was a eunuch, which we'll get into, that he didn't really have a lot of time or interest in extracurricular activities. I don't believe he was a heavy drinker. He, he never was presented as that. Although he was always in finery, you, you were never given an impression that he was a motivated man when it came to money or dragon gold. His motivation uh, was the people. And because Varus came from humble beginnings, he had an affinity to the people, which I think was his initial interest in Tyrion. While Varus played the game as well as he could, and it, it really was amazing that he can raise himself up to the station he did. And this had to do with not necessarily cunning, although Varus was a extremely cunning man. I think he had a a laser sharp focus on what needed to be done. And because he was always focused on the end result, which is a better Westeros for the people, not for the royals, for the people. Varus was about the people and this is what he saw in Tyrion that Tyrion hung around with the people. He had a disdain for the royals. And Varus, being who he was, always took an inventory of allies, enemies, and those he could use to get to his ultimate noble purpose. Yes, Varus was a noble man. And this nobility caused him to always make moves that were not self-serving. He never made a move to serve himself other than to keep himself alive so he can see his vision come to fruition. Now, to know who Varus is, we got to back up a little bit and, and, and see where he came from, and that will ultimately show you what made him who he was and led to his end. Now, Varus was born across the Narrow Sea in Lys. He was born a slave. So that's those humble beginnings. A slave made his way to the council. It's unheard of. It's unheard of. It's a, a, a busboy eventually being CEO of the company. Yeah, there were these stories around in the old days that that could happen, but it's unheard of now. It'll never happen. Now, as a child, he traveled with actors. Now, I remember, and if you watch the show, you know that there, were no, there was no TV, there was no internet, right? We know this, right? It's, it's AC. However, uh, the entertainment of the day were traveling acting tropes. And these folks would, would travel city to city to city and present um, a, a play of the day based on events that went on. You would have Robert's Rebellion, you'd have... Uh, dragons, any, anything they would do to, to entertain the people. And most people would come out and see this. It was something to do and to take your mind off of your everyday struggles. And he traveled the free cities. Um, with, and they never really go into whether he did act. Or he was, I think he was kind of a helper, you know, maybe a, a reader or you know, he cleaned up things or got uh, costumes together. But it, it doesn't really say whether he was happy or not. And, and that focus caught me or caught my attention, really, because you wonder, I, I would love to find out what type of life that was. Now, for me, I would think he was not happy. I would think that he was treated less than stellar. And even though he was a slave, he, he understands his needs and what he needs to, to be happy. And I'm sure they weren't feeling it because... Children were treated deplorably if they were not of well means. 
They didn't come from a good background, and you can see that on the show. And he's no different. So when he met a sorcerer in the city of Myrrh, he he didn't have a choice, clearly, because his master um, sold him at that point because the offer for him so far exceeded his value. It, it was an offer he couldn't refuse. And he gets sold to the sorcerer. Now, initially, and, and this shows that he had a higher than average intelligence uh, when he was a child. He believed the man would sexually abuse him. Now, here in this moment, that kind of lets answers the question I had just a couple minutes ago, which is, what was his life like with that troop of actors? Now, let's look at Hollywood and 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 the Sun and the Enquirer and. You and I both know that actors have some strange ways about them, celebrities in general. So him believing this as a child means that he probably experienced it at some point. And experiencing this abuse as a child factors in later with his affinity to his little birds. Now, for those of you that don't know, if you're still here and you haven't watched it, his little birds refer to uh, spies that would give him information that made him the master of whispers. So even though he believed the sorcerer was going to abuse him, um, that was not, in fact, what he wanted. What he wanted was ten times worse and Varus would find that out immediately because he gave him a potion that made him unable to move and speak. But he knew everything that was going on and he could feel the pain. All right? And that factors in because he then cuts off his testes and his penis, making him the aforementioned eunuch. This procedure... It was surprising that he even survived it. This is, uh, there's no uh, sanitary instruments at this point. It was probably some crudely shaped metal from a fire. And in the process of cutting it off, it cauterized and, and closed the wound. Um, but most of your deaths came from infection. And uh, it wasn't from the actual procedure, but it was from infection back then. So it was surprising that he, he survived this, and, and then he uses those sexual organs in a magical rite. And when he burns it in the brazier, and, and, and it's a cauldron of sorts, um, a pot, and you see this later on um, with Gendry and Melisandre. It's Melisandre. Um, the fire turns blue. So fire's red, obviously, and he throws this poor child's genitals and testes into the fire, and it turns blue. And the sorcerer, in the midst of this magical rite, calls to a voice, but it replies back, and Varus heard it. He heard it. Now, at this point, he must, from the pain and the shock and everything, must have passed out or maybe the potion had him go to sleep but afterwards um, the sorcerer had no more use for him and basically threw him out in the streets to die but he didn't instead at that point he resolved to live no matter what I am going to live I'm going to fight to hold on to the one thing I have which, which is this life so he would beg steal and unfortunately, he had to give in to what he feared the most, which is sell himself sexually. What parts he could sell. And a young boy with no genitals, you can understand what type of business he did. The people who would pay for him, they, they must have been horrible disgusting people but he survived 
Now, through this, he became an excellent thief. He had to be. You had to be. And you can kind of see this later on when Arya uh, had her time on the streets when she was dealing with Jag and Hagar in the House of Black and White. So you have to steal. You have to steal to survive because no one has any sympathy for you. Everyone is starving. Everyone is struggling. Everyone is moments away from death. So no one has any sympathy or empathy for a child of the street. Just another mouth to feed. But what he learned, and and understand that Varus is a reflection of modern times. He learned that information was the most valuable commodity he can get. And look at modern times. What's the number one sold item in the world? And before you say it, it's not black market organ sales. <laughs> it's close, but it's not. The number one item is data. Your information, and I tell you why, after this podcast, scroll through Facebook, scroll through Instagram, scroll through Google. Things you spoke out loud will then come up. Now, is that a, am I being a conspiracy theorist? No, that's actual truth. Your phone is listening to you, collecting and disseminating your information and your data so that it can be broken down and sold. That's your quantity, and that's what Varus found out. And through this, through this information and understanding that I can buy and trade this commodity, he was able to move himself up rather quickly from the slums of Myrrh. Now, he couldn't survive wholly off this information, but he was able to play people and raise his station. Now, he later started a pickpocketing business, and he eventually founded a group of spies, his little birds. He eventually made that happen. And he became a master spy and information trafficker. And if you're a fan of the, the movie Red, which I am, uh, he's like the frog. And you saw how well off he lived by just selling and trading information. And through this, his influence and his reputation grew. So great, in fact. So great from just this he would work himself to the small council. From a slave who sold himself on the street to the small council. Unheard of. Now, don't get me wrong. Everyone in Westeros has a history. And they're all disgusting, deplorable creatures. All of them do, do things that would make your head turn. But this in itself for him was amazing. To cross the narrow sea and to sit in the Red Keep, amazing. Now, he was a chief advisor to Aerys Targaryen. They, they, they talk about that, but they don't focus on that. I wish they did. He could have provided a, a great insight into the Mad King and what was going on in his head. And I understand they didn't want to go through that because it was the past. They referenced it and then moved on. Um, but for him to have to move through the Mad King, again, this man has to be very intelligent. Now, he kind of positions himself to be Eris's top advisor, so much so that he even rivaled Tywin Lannister for the king's heir. And this is a time when the king was, was in the middle of his madness. He didn't trust his wife. He didn't trust his son. And he had started not to trust Tywin. And, and we've spoken about this in Tywin's podcast where it was at this point where we think he raped Tywin's wife, and that he could be the father of Tyrion. But that's for another soap opera. Now, the experience he had at the hands of that sorcerer, of course, had him bitter. And it made him have a hatred for magic and its practitioner. And I've talked about this on multiple occasions, that the Game of Thrones show shied away from the magical portion of the uh, of of the mythology and it could have focused more but i understand i understand it they didn't want it to be hokey so they tried to present a very believable product to you but varus hates magic and and so anybody who is a magician or who practices in the dark arts varus is very obviously taken aback by them and has uh a disdain for them that is 
you can see. But he's the master of whispers, so he always keeps himself in check. Varus has never, not once, lost his temper that you can see. Now, I'm sure he's had some yelling sessions when no one's around, but in the public, he always keeps his composure, and he's always cool. Now, as a member of the small council, he served as the master of whispers, and that's what he does. He's a spy. He's a, he's a counterintelligence agent. He, he brings you information that helps you make the moves to keep your kingdom successful. Now he, But I want you to understand something, where Varus is at this point. He holds no titles, no castles, no lands, but they still refer to him as Lord. Now, this is a courtesy because of his position in the high council. But again, understand this. You're around snooty people, snobbery, and you clearly have nothing that they would respect, but they have to respect your skills. This man elevated himself through skill, and we can take this example and apply it to our real lives. Apply that skill, apply that tenacity. You, you reflect on yourself, find your strengths, sharpen them, and use them to the best of your abilities. And you can have the world in your palm. That is what Varus is. That's what Varus presented to you. That's what he was. He was a motivator. He was a motivating factor that shows the common people can be anything they want. And that's why he believed in the people and he wanted to elevate them. I think Varus would have supported Sam at the very end when Sam suggested that every person have a vote. But he had no voice at that point. Now, the Mad King arrested Brandon Stark for threatening Prince Rhaegar because he supposedly, quotation fingers, kidnapped the Stark girl, right? Now, Varus counseled restraint and urged the king to pardon him on the grounds that he was the heir to Winterfeld and the fact that the prince had abducted his sister in terms of what people believed. I still don't think he abducted her. I think she went willingly, and Brandon went down there to try to discuss this, but the king being mad, <laughs> he refused to heed the advice and had both Brandon and his father brutally, and I mean brutally, executed. And this led to the, the rebellion that ultimately toppled the Targaryen dynasty. Now, at this point, one would wonder why Varus would counsel restraint, right? Why would he counsel restraint? Because clearly this Targaryen man wasn't the best for the people, and toppling him over may have been the best thing. Well, Varus cares about the people. The Master of Whispers always cares about the people, and every move he made was based on the well-being of the people. And he understood that a war while it may down the line bring happiness to people, there's going to be great suffering. And the people that always suffer in the Game of Thrones are the norms, the muggles, the people with no lands and title that just struggle to survive every day. They suffer. You see this. This is a common theme that regular people suffer at the hands of the rich and their soldiers. You see the soldiers go from town to town and basically treat these people horribly. They rape their daughters. They, they rob them. They take everything from them. This is what they do. These are the, the people that, uh, and uh, let's not get into that, but where can we see that now? Where do we see the overseers or uh, uh, the, 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 the Lannister soldiers now that go out and do the bidding of the kings? And how do they treat those citizens who, by the way, pay to keep you in finery through my taxes. See, it's been going on forever and still going on. The players and the game is, is manipulated differently, but the results are all the same. Tywin comes to King's Landing with the entire army at his back, professing loyalty to the king. But we both know that um, 
that didn't go the way it was supposed to go because Jamie stabbed him in the back. <laughs> and uh, Robert takes over. Now, despite him being previously loyal to the Targaryens, he was pardoned by Robert, which is surprising in itself, right? Now, you would think, why would Robert pardon this man? A man like Robert, why would he pardon him? Well, long story short, Varys is a dangerous enemy because you don't know what he knows. That's where his strength is. Varys thinks fast, but speaks slowly. A virtue in any arena, any job, any position. Because you can break down the information, figure out the best course of action, and then speak. See, Robert spoke fast, thought fast. But I, I do believe this is probably John Aaron who counseled to Robert to pardon him and use him because as a usurper of the throne, you're going to want to get the people in line as quickly as possible. And this man can reach out and touch everybody in a time where you can only speak through ravens. If you notice, Varus got a lot of things done very quickly throughout the show. Now, being bald, fat, and soft due to his castration, the guy has no testosterone. Another reason why he was always very calm and mellable. He often puts on that public persona of being nothing more than that because he wants to disarm you. If you don't view him as an enemy, then your guard isn't up. If you view him as a humble, fawning, almost effeminate man, then you don't see any threat coming from his side, so you tend to speak a little more openly to him. And because he doesn't give you a pure allegiance to anybody but doesn't speak out against anybody, you underestimate him. And that's what he wants from you because now he controls you. He is living rent-free inside of your head. It's the facade he developed. It led those around him <laughs> to, to, to cheerfully <laughs> just cheerfully give him all the information he needed. He barely had to work for it. But the reality is he's cunning and he's ruthless when it comes to court politics. And he's the flip side of the master of coin, Peter Baelish. And the reason why he would outlast him is because unlike Baelish, he insists that his goals are to achieve what he honestly feels is best for the realm. The realm. Well, of course, though, the current rulers feel those should be two separate things. So there's the game. There's where he has to masterful, masterfully manipulate these people because with no name, no lands, and no titles, he, he doesn't have a leg to stand on. So all he can stand on is his position. Now, I think he had plenty of money because... You have to have money to move the way he did. Now, despite this ruthlessness and skill at politics, he does not want power. He doesn't want it. Isn't it? Because power is an illusion. See, he understands that. Power is an illusion. But for the common people of Westeros, yeah. I want, I, I, I'll manipulate it so that they can experience some type of happiness. You see? It, and it, he doesn't become, I don't want to say unhinged, because I don't think he ever becomes unhinged, but I think he starts to get off of his game when he jumps over to the Daenerys side. Because a man like Varys, being in the employ of someone, all he does is notice you. 24 hours a day, he watches you and figures you out. Remember that time he remarked to Ned, it's always the innocents who suffer. Remember that? And he talks about the children who are harmless and who are harmed, excuse me, and, and considers them blameless. It, it, Varus 
truly cared deeply about people, almost on the level of Batman, where you can say Batman beats up people and all these things, but he, he you've never met a man who cares more about his fellow man, and, and that's what Varus does. He could have easily turned his back on them. But again, he the only motivation he has is to make sure no one ever goes through what he went through again. This is who the Master of Whispers was. You see, he. this is why his motivation was so honorable. And it made him... that. Just, just think about this. He, he wasn't cruel. He was ne- that was a, a, another theme, the cruelty that those lords and upper crust people had towards those in his employ. See, he refers to them as the little birds. And what do you do with little birds? What do you do with... What, what, is, what is the most disarming thing about young animals? They're children. And across the world, I want this is I want to create this idealism amongst everyone that you must take care of children, not abuse them. You must take care of younglings, not destroy them. You must love them and and, and water them and feed them and cultivate them so they can grow up to be strong, viable trees that add to the environment and not take away. See, unlike Baelish, he's not indifferent or cruel towards those who he employs. He educates them. He gives them sweets, and he provides them with protection. See, the little birds didn't give him information because he gave them candy. Yeah, you give me candy, whatever. He didn't, they didn't care about him because he educated them. What do I care? I learn every day. They cared for him because he protected them. No one that worked for him was ever hurt. Now that means something. And 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 I for you who watch the show, you may know all of this. You may know every single thing I'm telling you, but I want you to understand that's who Lord Varus was. Now you can go through every single move that he made from season one all the way to season eight. But Lord Varus, above all, wanted to prevent any child from going through what he went through. He understood also, and I will tell you this, Varus had better vision than anybody in that show, even Tywin Lannister, because he understood that if we can get past this Lord and Lady Power struggle, He understood that if we can get past that and get the people involved, let them choose their leaders and improve their day-to-day lives, then the realm will grow as a whole and we will advance and we will have more than we have now. I know you feel that six million dragons is a lot, but you will have billions later if you just listen to me. And then we won't have, we will have happiness. We will have fairness and equality. We'll have a better quality of life. And no child will ever be sold to a magician again. That's who Lord Varus was. That's who the spider is. Now, I'm going to go into moves that the spider made probably on a later podcast because I, I plan to have one um, where we discuss. Littlefinger and Varus, the the two master of whispers, and who actually made the better moves. Now, uh, again, from this podcast, you would feel that Varus did, but uh, I haven't even gotten to Littlefinger yet because there's some things he did that I actually agree with. Well, not say agree with, but at the time, it was the only move that he could make. But it, again, I want you to understand that Varus... His motivation was never self-serving. And even though that may have been obvious to you, most people don't realize that. Most people thought, because you can't, you can't fathom that. You can't understand someone doing something 
just for the sake of doing it. That's not the world we live in. People don't do anything for you unless they get something in return. Varus never got anything directly in return for everything he did. Every move he made was for the betterment of others. So I, I, that was dramatic pause. I didn't go anywhere. I want you to understand that about him. The Master of Whispers never had any needs other than his need to fulfill yours. So when he meets his end, it was the ultimate betrayal to him and what he did. And it showed that he was actually right. He was right. Remember what he tells Littlefinger. I did what I did for the good of the realm. And that's when Littlefinger goes off on his tangent, the realm. Do you know what the realm is? The thousand blades of Aegon's enemies. A story we agreed to tell each other over and over again until we forget that it's a lie. So Littlefinger was very uh, you know, straight to the point with this one. But then Varus comes back. But what do we have left once we abandon that lie? Chaos. Chaos, a gaping pit waiting to swallow us all. He understood that this lifestyle that you all prescribe to this Game of Thrones is unsustainable and will eventually burn the city down. And that's what happened when Drogon flew in. Woo! This was a quick one. This was a quick one. We're not going directly into Vars. Again, I'm I'm going to go into him season by season with the Lord Peter Baelish versus Vars podcast. Now, that's coming up in a few weeks, so you won't have to wait too long. But I just wanted to, to wet your whistle a little bit, give you a little something, let you understand that uh, Vars is, is a man that needs to be uh, viewed and uh, broken down and, and studied. His moves, I liken his moves... Uh, to a new age art of war. You say, well, what's going on? Art of war. Everyone tells you, read the art of war, read the art of war, read the Machiavelli, the Prince, read these things, and you'll understand how to move and operate in business. But Varus's example can teach you how to move and operate in life by controlling your desires, controlling your motivations. What do I need? We're very, we're very basic creatures. We want our desires filled when we want them filled. And not before, not after. That's what Vars teaches you. Control your, control your desires and plan out what you do. Always play chess, never checkers. Now, it didn't work out for him, but did it? Because the realm still got what they wanted. Well, what he wanted. Oh, it appeared, though. It appeared that way. You had a power structure that actually cared about the well-being of the people. So in, the, in, in, in a sense, Lord Varus won the Game of Thrones. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to Southside Westeros. We look forward to you coming back and visiting us again. If you want to email us, you can reach us at southsidewesteros at gmail.com. You can also reach us at Southside Westeros at both Instagram, Facebook, and Twitch. We're SS Westeros at Cup of Coffee and Twitter. If you want to donate to the program to keep getting this great content, please donate to our Patreon or our cash app, both are Southside Westeros. Valor do Harris. And may the mother bring seven blessings to you all.